Hello and a warm welcome to this week's Racing Postcast, brought to you by the Racing Post, sponsored by Unibet on a weekend full of handicap clues, full of derby clues, full of Oaks clues, and we've even got some classics on Sunday over the season, France. We've got a great panel this weekend to preview the action. We've got Matt Gardner, our two-year-old handicapper. I'd be intrigued to know who he's liked as a two-year-old so far this season. Johnny Pearson, who will give us all things French at the back end of the postcast. And from Unibet, we have Ed Nicholson. And Ed, you're beaming in from Gibraltar, is that right? Live from Gibraltar, yes. You can't tell because it's just the room. But um, it is Gibraltar, yeah. It's uh, very sunny here, but I believe it's very sunny back back in the good old UK, is it? The, the weather's come out and put its hat on. Absolutely. Summer is here. Summer is here. Um, we'll have a quick chat, gents, just briefly about last weekend and the, uh, the 2,000 and 1,000 guineas. Worth giving them a mention. Matt, I'll come to you first. There's a bit of heartbreak for myself with Romatuel in the, the 1,000 guineas with... Already in the Metro, a lot saying on social media, kicking too soon, and she may be potentially the best horse in the race. What do we make of, of both the guineas? Was there any eye catchers in behind that you want to take note of going forward? Yeah, she was, I, I, She surprised me a little bit. I mean, she didn't stay, but that wasn't stamina related, really, as, as much as, like you say, tactics a little bit. Um, there, there were a couple, obviously, that knocked the eye out in the, in the thousand guineas, her and Tamfana. Um, I mean, the, mo- the most interesting thing is is the city of Triangle, isn't it? Um, mm. And I think some of that boils down to unrealistic expectations for him a little bit. Um, obviously, he, he, he bombed out and he was nowhere near his two-year-old form. But um, I wrote a thing earlier in the year about these 120 plus two-year-olds, you know, what looks like a good sort of achievement for them as three-year-olds. Most of them regress a little bit. You know, the average, I think, peak performance figures a couple of pounds below what they do as two-year-olds so you know you, you, getting anywhere near the likes of frankel even hawk wing the best o'brien horse you know it's, it's not unrealistic but it's a massive ask so what what he does for the rest of the year will be really interesting but it looks a pretty good 2000 guineas as well to me Absolutely, yeah, it could be a really good 2000. I thought the win was exceptional. I actually thought both of the Hannon horses are going to go on to do big things this season. Uh, Johnny Pearson, Unibet are currently going 4-1 to one about City of Troy for the derby. You know, we saw August Rodan bomb out in the 2000 Guineas last year and then go on to win the event at Epsom. Is that 4-1 to one tempt you anyway, or would you not, not be touching him with a barge pole at um, the moment? 4-1, uh, to one, I would not be going anywhere near that. I mean, you know, I'm not saying the horse can't win the derby. There's a, there's a couple of horses that have really caught my eye so far this season, and we might get some more clues on them this week, and we'll mention them later on in the show. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, Ed, there was a bit of a move, wasn't there, yesterday for City of Troy in the derby, I believe. I might be wrong there, but there was a move in the market. A little bit of a move, yeah. I mean, it's all guesswork, isn't it? Because if mm. the City of Troy that, that turned up as a two-year-old comes to the derby, it'll be a shorter price. Let's put it that way. Um, but it, it, the horse had turned up for the 2,000 guineas should be a bigger price. So it's it's all a bit of guesswork, isn't it? But, I mean, the Irish 2,000 guineas looks like it's going to be the uh, the target for both of the Hannons uh, placed horses that we gave quite a good mention to in the podcast last week. At, um, that Craven is always a good race. You know, it, 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 they were 33 to 1 at the time when we did the, the podcast. Mm. Um, but came, six, came third at 16 to 1. And Resalian, I mean, if... if I can't. I bet. I bet they can't believe they beat City of Troy and didn't win the 2000 Guineas. Um, I think Rosalian is a horse that they absolutely love. So yeah, I agree with you, Sam. I think there are plenty of good races for both of them, but I think Rosalian's the one that they really think will will, will, will step up. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see. Really excited about both of them. I think Artem would be interesting. I'd love to see him go to Goodwood in the summer for the Sussex Stakes. He obviously won the Vintage there last year so it'd be interesting to see if that's a potential target over a mile for him but we will wait and see let us know down in the comments what you thought of the two classics from the previous week and let's get into the racing then for this week we've got ascot haydock and lingfield to cover we're going to cover ascot and haydock in the first part of the show and we start off there with the opening race which is the 130 which is a flat handicap a class for event over a mile and a half and qatari is currently top in the market with uni better three to one think first is six to one king of the plains is seven to one great bedwin is uh, 15 to two way of life eight to one double figures about the rest of the field. And Matt, I'll let you kick things off here. Who do you like in this? It's an interesting handicap. The The four-year-olds have done pretty well in this in the last few years. I think they've won the last four run-ins of it, which isn't a massive surprise considering last year's, the previous year's three-year-old form is is usually dead solid. Um, 
Hannan's got a couple. You mentioned one of them, great breadwin. Um, I think he might want a bit further this year, to be honest. He looks more like a stayer to me. I, I liked his other one, Graham, who's who's a bigger price. Um, his form last year is pretty pretty good. He was he was generally pretty progressive. Um, won a couple of races. Um, he was down the field on his reappearance at Newbury. That was in a big field. The leaders went really hard that day, and he sat second. Um, the first sort of handful all came from the back. Um, I think the step back up in trip is going to suit. I think Ascot, his usual positive ride, it, it generally pays off on the round course. Um, you, you need to be in kind of position A at Ascot on the round course, really. So um, he's a biggish price. He was about 16s, I think. So um, I thought he'd be he'd be up to out running that. Okay, Richard Hannon horse kick things off, but the second string by the looks of things, 16 to 1, Graham for Matt Gardner. Uh, Ed Nixon, you're going to have to guide me on any offers, extra places this week. Um, have we got anything here, and who do you like? Yeah, we have. We've got our money back second or third in this opening race at Ascot, the 130. Um, incidentally, if you do fancy any Hannon horse, uh, we're writing the blog today with him about his runner, so that will be available uh, later on Thursday or early on Friday. So do go and have a look at Richard Hannon's blog. It is really, it's one of the most read blogs of the whole Unibet uh, content site. And he does like to put up a few horses. So um, do go there. I, I thought this race um, was really difficult, but I, I've, I've kind of plumped for one of the favourites, Qatari, who you'll know plenty about, Sam, um, coming from the more stable. Um, when we do these podcasts, which are two days before the race, we, the worst thing about doing them is we don't know what the ground's going to be, but I've, I've looked at the weather apps um, and it looks like there's, there's no real rain forecast for the next two or three days. So I doubt whether it'll get any softer than good to soft. Um, but this fella's won so easily and heavy as well as on good ground that this particular horse looks bomb-proof, whatever they're going. Um, he did win really ridiculously easy at Salisbury last time by 10 lengths. Uh, got a penalty. I noticed he was entered for three different races um, over the next few days to try to take advantage of, uh, of the before the handicapper can reassess him. Um, I just thought he had the best form. It's a lightly lightly raced individual. Um, I think he, you know the one mile four should suit perfectly. Um, it got loads of ticks in my box, so it's uneventful to say that I'm going for the favourite. But um, I, I just thought Qatari was strong claims that around about three to one. The only thing I would say, he was disappointing over hurdles, wasn't he? Really? Um, and they've come back to the flat. I don't know whether he, I mean, he's won twice now. I don't know, is he a disappointing sort? It, it, not so far in his flat career, that's for sure. So I, he looked so good last time that I, I can't leave him alone, to be honest. I thought he was a good bet around about three to one. Absolutely, yeah. Previously from the Jean-Claude Rouget camp, then came to the Gary Moore team, went over the National Hunt Sphere, and it didn't quite work out. But since returning back to the flat, things have been working out perfectly fine for Qatari and comes here looking for a hat-trick. Johnny Pearson, who for you in the 130? Uh, there's a couple that have caught my eye, which unfortunately are sort of both drawn fairly wide, which is not likely to be ideal. But you can get, you know, it's not it's not set in stone that it's going to be a, not, not allow you to win the race. Now, King of the Plains and Obsidian Knight. Obsidian Knight obviously won well at Chelmsford on their reappearance, uh, what, a couple of weeks ago? And he won with a bid in hand that there, felt, getting there under a good ride, getting there later on. I think the step back up to a mile and a half should really suit. And he's he's going to be, you know, a bit fitter for it and should run very well again. And King of the Plains, I thought, was very interesting. Having his first run for James Horton, having been sold from Qatar. It was interesting that David Redford has, has a share in the horse now. He's racing manager to um, Qatar. So they, you, know, you get the impression they've definitely seen something there they like. OK, he flopped a couple of times last season. But if you take those runs at Doncaster and Hamilton away, his form's looking pretty rock solid, including a win last time out. I think he can really step forward this season. OK, so king of the plains and uh, obsidian knight for Johnny Pearson. We've then got Qatari for Ed Nixon. And then Graham at a big price at 16 to 1 for Matt Gardner. On to the 205 then, which is a British EBF Phillies handicap. Class 2 event over a mile. Where Zuzana is topping the market at 4 to 1. Flying Finn, 9 to 2. Mother Mary, 6 to 1. Top, uh, top Anger is 7 to 1. Strong Impact, 15 to 2. Rose Prick and My Margie, 8 to 1. Double figures about the other three in the field. Uh, to you first here, Johnny Pearson. Who do you like? I quite like Top Anger for Sheen Murphy and Andrew Baldwin. Was well, a little bit disappointing last time at Newbury, but she didn't get. She got stuck in behind horses a couple of times and wasn't then given the hardest time once once the race was over for her. 
And you know the form's looking pretty good with the with the third going on to win the thousand guineas at the weekend. Yeah. The winner of that race is running in the French thousand guineas on Sunday, I believe, or, or at, at least entered for this stage anyway. And I think it could be a really strong piece of form going forward through the season. Andrew Boarding and Ashin uh, and Ashin Murphy started the season pretty well, and there's not too many negatives here. I think Rose Prick could be one that really puts a bit of danger in. But I think Topanga has a really, really good chance here. Absolutely. He shows really good form. Showing really good form, but I mean, the, the, in the market, it looks like the horse is drifting, which is a bit unusual. But yeah, Folgaria looks like she's going to head to the 1,000 guineas out in France. And El Malco, who was third that day, has since won the 1,000 guineas here. Uh, Matt Gardner, to you. Who do you like in this one? Yeah, the Topanga is definitely interesting. I, I like the the other one that we don't know that much about, which is my my Margie. Um, the proviso being that she needs to prove that she can take to turf. Um, it's probably worth uh, Ed mentioned the ground in the in, on the previous race. The the straight course here it's a generally a little bit firmer than the round course. Um, so I mean she's she's won twice on the old weather. She's a half sister to a turf winner. The dam was a turf winner out in the US. So there's the sort of hope that she can that she can take to it. Um, on on the face of it, she wasn't that impressive last time. She she won by a sort of short margin in a in a bit of a muddling race. But I don't think that suited it. it was she's she's the sort of filly that I think a decent decently run mile stiffish mile that she'll get here. I think that's really going to suit her. Um, she's the other one like Topanga that we don't know all that much about. I think she's got a bit more to come, providing she can sort of translate that that form to turf. Okay, and my Margie, Richard Hughes, has started the season so well. I think they're in for a massive season, actually. The Hughes camp, really excited about some of their horses. Ed Nixon, you're going to finish us off in the 205. What have we got here? Well, I'm, I'm going along with Jonathan. I've gone for uh, Topanga. Um, I love it when you have a horse that kind of runs in a classic trial or doesn't have much form and bumps into a few good horses, and then it turns up in a handicap after three runs. I just like it to try and work out is it well handicapped or it isn't. I don't you don't know but i just it just I, the rating of 88 just took my head straight away when i looked at it and looked at the form that he's been running in um, has she has i didn't think that that was a bad run uh, um at newbury um i i, I noticed like jonathan that uh, she has drifted remarkably since the uh, opening show when i looked at it she was 11 to 2 5 to 1 she's now sevens and eights and bigger um i just wondered whether that may be to do with the drying ground I noted that she ran on the all-weather um, as a two-year-old, maybe. But uh, she was a you know book one, 230,000 guinea purchase, uh, only three runs. Y y you would like to think, if you bought this filly, that she's better than an 88-rated handicapper, wouldn't you? Um, so I just thought it was a good price. I am a little wary of the drift, I must admit. I, that there might be something there that we don't know. Perhaps it doesn't like the faster ground conditions, that it probably will be down the straight mile on Saturday at Ascot. But... Yeah, those prices, I, I kind of thought that she was a decent price of 11 to 2, so she's she's even better at 7 to 1. Yeah, 7 to 1. Two votes for Topanga then, and one vote for my Margie for Matt Gardner. Let's move on to the big race there, the big Heritage Handicap on the card at Ascot. 240 is the Victoria Cup. Over seven furlongs, Emma Stabshire is the 13 to 2 favourite here for the John and Fady Gosden team. Pearl Dorr is 9 to 1. Popmaster 10 to 1. The Wizard of Eyes 11 to 1. Fantastic Fox Hickory, they're also 11 to 1. Ramazan, Merlin the Wizard 12 to 1. And 14 to 1. Bar these. There's definitely going to be extra places here, Ed Nicholson. Yeah, there is uh, an extra place available for the uh, Victoria Cup. It's Great race. I always look forward to this race because for me, it's that's when the big handicaps, the sprint handicaps begin. And when you go through the season, the form does tie into this race quite a lot, whether it's a six furlong handicaps or the mile handicaps. It's quite a nice um, handicap to start off with over seven furlongs. And also at Ascot, I love hold up horses in fast, in sprint, six furlong, seven furlong races where there's plenty of runners and plenty of cover. They do have an incredible uh, record or factor. Um, for winning these sort of races. And I'm going for one here in Pildor. Um, I think you can put a, a line through Pildor's uh, performance at headquarters 23 days ago that, that they weren't coming from behind. And, you know, that was a, a pipe opener as well. Uh, I think that um, he's based upon his, on his form last season at Ascot as well on this ground. He's got every chance. He's gone, he's gone to Ascot three times. He's come first, second and third. And, and as a, a lot of horses do. Once you find a horse that runs well at a track, they tend to continually run well at a track. But even more so at Ascot, 
up the straight mile, uh, any of the six, seven furlong, eight furlong mile races. Um, and I, I just thought that he, he showed that he liked Ascot. He's one, he's, he's one been placed uh, twice on the good to soft ground. Um, his seven furlong runs, he's had nine of those. He's a one, one two, come second once and third three times. So everything looks well. The ground's going to be a bit quicker, but that's no problem. because He's finished third on good ground um, over this distance at Ascot, rated 90. He's rated 90 here. There's everything in his favour. Uh, and the cherry on top of the cake is that Sylvester de Stu's riding, who's riding at the top of his form at the moment, has got so much confidence. So I, although it's a competitive handicap, um, I thought he would be favourite. He's, he's he's at the top of the market, but he's ten to one, and I thought that was a fair price each way, especially with the extra places. Can't see him. Can't see him being out of the places myself. Yeah, Pearl Door, yeah, currently yeah, around nine to one. Sylvester Souza, one thousand guineas winning jockey aboard. This this race had bad memories for last year because I went to Ascot, I had six horses in the trifecta, and they finished first, third, fourth, fifth. And sixth, uh, which wasn't ideal. Yeah, I almost landed it. Um, just didn't get the second. Matt Gardner, um, who do you like in this? Yeah, I'm right there with Ed. I absolutely love Pearl Door in this, to be honest. Um, I, you know, on, on, on the one hand, the case is like dead obvious, and it, you know, Ed, Ed's done a, a good job of making it. But I think in some ways, it's almost even like a bit more nuanced than that. In you know, Omar has got this reputation for being like, you know, he's he's obviously really really good at getting one ready whether it's a, a stable newcomer, whatever it is. But I think to sort of focus on that a bit does him a disservice. Like he's, the, these horses that he gets, they, they thrive for a long time with him. And, and mm. Pearl Door last year, you know, he was, he was second on his first start for Omara. It was another five runs before he won for him. And then it was kind of like PB after PB for, for him after, from then on. Um, like Ed said, he was, you know, forget his reappearance. He needed the run. That all served its purpose. New market that day was, was not riding to suit him by any means. Um, I think he's drawn in the right place. He's he's, drawn, he's in box 14. I think the pace all looks sort of middle to high to me. Um, if you watched Ascot last week, being on the stand side was an advantage. They were all kind of coming up that wing. Um, so, yeah, I was I was really, really struggling to pick a hole in Pearl Door, to be honest. Pearl Door, then two votes in the Victoria Cup for Pearl Door. If there was ever a race on the postcast where we weren't going to get a hat-trick, it would be the Victoria Cup. And Johnny Pearson... You're going to ruin it here. Is it a hat trick for Pearl Door? Um, no, absolutely not. I mean, they've, they, they, for what seems a very tricky race, they're far too keen and confident on one horse. My liking, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, obviously there's obvious claims there, and it, you know it's hard to you can't really disagree with anything they've said. But I'm I'm going to go for one at a bit more of a price for the Roger Tillyard in Caraggio. The drawn eleven slightly off putting bang in the middle. But I was quite taken with his reappearance at Kempton last time. He was up with the pace, and the winner was on the pace throughout. But the others up there faded in the second and third. And Hickory finished second that day and was in this race at well. At a much shorter price, came from behind. I think I think Caraggio has got some decent form in the past and can really take a step forward from that. I think the mile can can well suit here if if given a good ride, cut, getting a bit of cover in behind horses. And I, I fully expect him to be there. Come in the mix, come the end of the race. Okay, Caraggio around 16, 18 to 1 with Uni Better, another big price of the Roger Till team this time around. Let's move across the spheres to the National Hunt Sphere for one race. 3.15 at Haydock, the one race on ITV there is the Swinton Handicap Hurdle. Premier Handicap Class 1 race over two miles where Joseph O'Brien sends a horse over here in Lark in the morning, the Boodles Juvenile Handicap. Hurdle winner from the Cheltenham Festival, currently the 85 to 40 favourite of Unibet. Affidil for the Nichols Camp, 13 to 2. Bully is 9 to 1. Jin Coco, 10 to 1. Tin 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 and Rare Middleton, 11 to 1. 12 to 1 about Rigney Mill and 14 to 1 bar these. Uh, where should I start? I'll start with you again here, Ed Nicholson. Lark in the morning, a short price favourite for the Joseph O'Brien team here. Probably one of the shortest price we'll have on the whole of the postcast this week. What do we make of this favourite? Well, first of all, extra place, as you would expect for a race like this. Um, I'm over here in Gibraltar with the trading team, and I went over and had a chat with them before the podcast, and they said when they opened the book on this, they, they put in a lark in the morning at 5-1, to one, and within minutes it was down to 15-8. to eight. Um, So the early money has come for lark in the morning. He's drifted a little bit since that. He's gone back out to around 5-2. to two. Um, But all the money was only for one horse when we opened up this book. 
uh, lark in the morning. Now, having said that, so the, the professionals are on, no doubt, and our odds compilers have cut the odds. I think, think it's worth taking on um, at five to two. Um, he, he won, you know, he obviously won at the Cheltenham Festival really easily, um, off a racing somewhat eight pounds lower than he's running on today, so 130. But if you go through the form of the Boodles, or went through the, the next nine horses that ran, only one of them has won a race um, that they've contested since since that race. And, and not only did the others lose, they all got absolutely beaten into next week. So the only one that won was actually Stable Companion Harsh, who came fourth and then followed up. Um, so I, I, th- I think, you know, that's, that shouldn't be a reason in its own just to oppose a horse. If the other horses it beat don't win, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that. But the form might not be as, as, as solid as everyone thinks it is. That's the point I'm making. Um, they obviously want to come over here for the ground, I would have thought as well, as the big prize. Um, and anything that Joe uh, that Joe sends over here, Joseph Price sends over here, has got to has got to be worth a second look. You know, I, I understand all of that, but there are a few good horses in here, horses that have run well on this sort of track at this sort of year uh, on this sort of ground, and they've been not been having this sort of ground. They've not been running at this sort of trip. They've not been here at Haydock. So there's reasons maybe that you might get a big outsider coming. Now, which one? I, I really don't know, but I'm going to take a real punt. Uh, and go for a horse that I've always liked. He's run in this race before, I think in fifth, and he's a big price, about 20 to 1, but Luttrell Lad. Uh, he ran in this race when he was trained by Philip Hobbs. Um, he's now with Tom Lacey. I'm a big fan of Tom Lacey. I think he trains horses really well and places them exceptionally well. I think he ran here, Luttrell Lad, when he was with Hobbs, ran here of 135 and finished fifth, I think. Um, and now he's, what, on 128. Um, obviously, he's not, he's not the horse he once was. He's now eight. Um, we know that he's, you know, he, he, he will like this sort of um, straight, uh, um, not undulating, what do you call it? It's flat, flat track. Um, and, he will, and he will also, you know, like the ground. Uh, he, I think he's been running over two and a half quite a lot. And he's back down to two. A fast run two mile, I think, on a flat track, on a faster surface, I think will suit him. And it, it, bits of bobs with former Aintree, mean he really hasn't got much chance with a couple of the others in the race on actual pounds and lengths but I, he did make mistakes in that race at Aintree um Stan Shepherd gets on board he has been ridden by a seven pound claiming conditional for the last two runs um so I think there are reasons to perhaps think that he he can do a bit better at a big price um so Luttrell Lad at around about 20 to 1 I think he is Sam Luttrell Lad for Ed Nixon at a big price is taking on the favorite lark in the morning Oh, I really like Lark in the Morning here, and I might be completely wrong. Uh, Johnny Pearson, I know you're going to be taking on Lark in the Morning. I mean, yeah, the horse gives me nightmares. You know, I've been, <laughs> when, he, when in 21 of January, I had him down as a potential Boodles horse, and they go and get non runner twice on heavy ground, and then goes and wins easily on heavy ground in, in the Boodles. I was, you know, not not the biggest fan of that move. Uh, to further Ed's point, uh, the 9th and the 12th uh, from the Boodles have both won at Punchestown uh, last week, which is. But I wouldn't take too much note of that. They were beating so far out of distance at Cheltenham. It's, you know, the ground and conditions are probably more likely than anything for that. Um, yeah, like in the morning, I, th- I think he's too short a price. And, you know, there's a, there's a case to be made for a lot of, a lot of horses in here. You know, you, both uh, yourself and Edward at Cheltenham, where Ray Middleton, Tintin and Tapley are all in the first or home. You know, that's a good piece of form, but I'm not sure it'll be good enough to, to win this race here. And I've decided I'm going to go on... One that I've backed previously on the tip previously on the pod called All the Glory for the John Joe O'Neill team. You know, she was very impressive when winning at Newbury when we when we saw her back in March. And I think there's more to come from that. that was a you know first run for a few months and I think there's more to come from her and she should run well at a bit of a price there. Okay, all the glory again around sixteen to one for Johnny Pearson. There's me fancying the favourite once again. Matt Gardner, you're gonna fancy one at a price as well, or are you gonna side with the favourite? Uh, yeah, I I think he's He's probably a just the right price to slightly skinny, I think, for me. Um, he's taking chunks out of the market, and he's prob- probably a little bit more so than, than than how competitive the race is. I quite like Rare Middleton. I think this will suit him more than Cheltenham does. Um, he looks like a, a very sort of swinton type of horse to me, kind of strong travelling speedster. Um, at a price, I thought Pick a Number had run quite well, who... This is going to be like completely different to the races that he's been winning, like smallish fields at smallish tracks. But his his last win stacks up pretty well. He beat a horse who was was going there looking for the hat trick. Um, the third was potentially chucked in on its chase form, and and the fourth was pretty unexposed as well. So 
you know, it's a it's a very different sort of race. He's a big price, but I, I can see him running that. But I'd, I'd I'd probably side with with Rare Middleton. I think. Okay, Rare Middleton, the main selection. You've I don't know if you've just made up a word in being a Swintony type of horse, but we'll we'll go with it. Uh, I don't know how often that will get used down during the National Hunt season next year. We'll wait and see. Uh, So there we go. There are the selections for the Swinton Handicap Hurdle. We're going to be going to Lingfield shortly after this for some classic trials. Want betting on the horses to be anything but flat. With an app that impresses every time out. You're on. Want to watch live streaming of races in the UK, Ireland and around the globe? And get a chance to win even bigger with three uni boosts every day on any horses you want. Unibet, you're on. Welcome back to part two of this week's Racing Postcast, brought to you by the Racing Post, sponsored by Unibet. You've got Sam Hart, Matt Gardner, Ed Nicholson and Johnny Pearson taking you through the weekend action. We head to Lingfield next, four races on ITV from Lingfield. They're going to have their Derby and Oaks trials, but we kick things off with a handicap there over a mile and a half, a class two event where Imeric is currently topping the market at nine to four of Unibet. Flash Bardot is 100 to 30, true legend. 9 to 2, if not now, 15 to 2, track of time, 17 to 2, base note, 9 to 1, double figures. About the rest of them in the field. Uh, Matt Garner, I'll start with you on this one here. James Doyle and Roger Varian team up with the favourite. Is this going to be a likeable horse? Uh, he's, he's a horse that I've had issues with in the past. He's, his mm. profile's pretty, pretty hit and miss. Um, I, I didn't think this was that strong a race, to be honest. And ultimately, I thought he'd be quite hard to beat. Um, he his progress has sort of come in fits and starts a bit, and then he's disappointed when when you fancied him. But he he won at Beverly at the back end of last year, and I thought he did really well to to get up. The it can be quite hard to catch front runners there, and the second very much got the run of the race, and he came from off the pace to to win pretty comfortably. Um, he's on his race course debut, he finished second, and the, the three times after that that he's had a decent break, he's won all three, including on reappearance last year. Um, I'm I'm struggling to convince myself that he's a decent bet as short as he is just because of his profile, but I don't really like anything against him. So um, yeah, I I think he'll win. Okay, ten to selection for I Merrick at the top of the market. There, I was actually gutted that Champagne Piaf got taken out of this race. A horse that I'm a huge huge fan of. Look out for Champagne Piaf. I think he's extremely well handicapped, and he'll probably head to Epsom. I'd imagine where he won last time. Johnny Pearson to you next. The 150, the handicap on the card. Who do you like? Uh, as Matt said, it doesn't look to be the strongest of races on paper. You know, Flash Bardo won nicely enough at Doncaster, but you know, she's one I'd much prefer on, on a softer surface. Um, I'm, I've ended up deciding I'm going to go with a six-year-old mare from Germany in Colossal, a new recruit for Jamie Osborne. Jamie Osborne's stable in pretty decent form so far, and Colossal's got pretty decent form in Germany from last season. Winning in Grade Three company, beating Vapicella in India, who are two good, good horses in themselves. And if if Jamie Osborne has her in good form, she could really um, put her hat in the ring here. Okay, colossal for Johnny Pearson, a German recruit, and to Ed Nixon to finish things off in the handicap at Lingfield. I've got the same sort of thoughts as Matt here. Um, when I looked at the race, I thought Imeric was a likely winner, but I also put down seven to two next to his name. He's now nine to four. So again, same as Matt, I think the price is a bit skinny. I think he's the most likely winner. Um, I was impressed by his performance at Beverly when he coming into home straight and even inside the final two furlongs, he, he didn't look like he was the winner. And yet when you look at the end of the race, he's powered clear um, in the style of an improving horse. We haven't seen him for 252 days, but yeah, in a weak looking race, I think he's the most likely winner. Okay, two votes for Ryan Merrick then, and two, well, one vote for one at a colossal price in Colossal at 16 to one. For Johnny Pearson. Let's move into the trials then, gents. The 225 at Lingfield is the Oaks Trial Philly Stakes, a listed contest just shy of a mile and a half here, where Danielle is the even money favourite of Unibet. Treasure is 4 to 1. Rubies are red, is 9 to 2. You Got To Me is 11 to 2. Molten Rock, 17 to 2. Big Time Bridget, 33 to 1. And Cherry Burton also. 33 to 1. A really interesting race, this Ed Nixon. The favourite absolutely bolting up at Weatherby last time. You've got two Rafe Beckett fillies in here. You can never discount a Rafe Beckett filly, especially going towards the Oaks. And an Aidan O'Brien filly, who I think it's fair to say a lot of the Aidan O'Brien 
fillies, these three-year-olds that have come out and run, they're going to take massive step forwards and know that that's going to be the case with a horse like Ruby's a Red. How did you analyse this one? Very difficult, isn't it? The basic form from one or two is very good, having contested group races and those that have got loads of potential, obviously their form doesn't look any good at the moment, but that's what you get when you come to trials. That's exactly why they're there. Um, so, yeah, from an analysis point of view, uh, Daniel's a 6-4 to four favourite, just 10-1 to one to win the Oaks itself. Um, Stable's in good form. Jockey's cracking start to his kind of, in inverted commas, career with the Gostons. Um, rode a really good race at, at Newmarket, in the pretty poly. Um, so Daniel's the favourite and has every chance based upon those those runs. Um, Treasure is an interesting one for me. Um, didn't really know what it was doing in the back end, Maven in, in Nottingham. And that's the kind of route that Rafe Beckett takes with many a good filly that have gone on to contest the Oaks or even win the Oaks. Uh, giant grey, changed her legs two or three times in the final two furlongs and just powered home. Um, unbeaten. Again, we don't know what the ground would be like. It's going to be very different ground. That was heavy. Uh, this is this is going to be um, good, I think, and could be even faster if the weather, if all my weather app's correct. Um, and then you've got Rubies of Red from the powerful Aidan O'Brien stable who could, could step up on her two runs. The one I'm going to go for, though, is Molten Rock uh, from Carl Burke's stable. I, I kind of like this filly, and so much so, I backed her when she ran at Longchamp, um, and she got beat. She came fourth. Um, I, I don't think the race was run to suit myself. Um, and I think uh, she's a big price at 10 to 1. Uh, she's got experience, uh, more experience than many of these in the race. Um, certainly, the, you know, the, more towards the front end of the market, the ones that could be good, um, but haven't had the runs. So I'm just going to go Molten Rock, really kind of perform well in, in this sort of class. Okay, Molten Rock, yeah, around 10 to 1 there for the Carl Burke team, who have just been sensational form towards the start of this season. I was really impressed with actually their winner, was it Caviar Heights in the, the listed race at Newmarket? Um, over the weekend, I was really, really impressed by that horse. Probably going to the Dante as well, which is going to be exciting. Uh, Matt Gardner, I'll come to you next. Who do you like? The one at the top of the market, even money currently, Unibet Daniel for the Gosden team. How impressed were you oh. with that performance at Weatherby? You you couldn't get more style over substance if you tried, could you? I don't mm. think than that. Um, I mean, obviously she's she's got the pedigree to back it up, doesn't she? But if you take her out at the top handful of yards, you know Gosden Haggis. Appleby O'Brien. There's no way she's even money for this, is she? I mean, the the horse that beat her at Chelmsford uh, was tailed off in a listed race last time. Like, you know, she, she's 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 obviously all potential, isn't she? Um, she might be really good, but you know, even money in a trial with a with a field full of interesting fillies against her just wouldn't be for me, really. Um, Ed mentioned Treasure. I I like Rafe Beckett's other one. Uh, you got to me. Um, the Beckett Yard's really, really starting to get going now. And she she won on her debut at Kempton. Uh, she beat a couple of sort of mid-80s horses that had all had quite a bit, of, that both had quite a bit of experience already. Uh, she ran in a listed race after that and finished behind Molten Rock. Um, she's got, you know, her pedigree screams middle distance three-year-old. Um, you know, she's going to have to take a big step forward. But, um, yeah, she, she was the one that I, I, I liked most in this. Okay, you got to me, the other Rafe Beckett Philly Hector Crouch board this one for Matt Gardner and to Johnny Pearson. Are you taking on the favourite as well? Uh, I'm not really too sure what to make of the race. It's, you know, it's not much, a huge amount of form to go off. You'd expect Rubies the Red to improve on what she'd done, but then Galileo Dame at Chester was a little yeah. disappointing. But I would also say, with a different ride, I'd expect her to have finished a lot closer than she did. Um, but I'm trying to, you know, trying to work out where the pace is going to come from. Ruby's a red made it last time at Leopardstown. That possibly took its toll on heavy ground that come the end of the race. And Danielle's been prominent in the racing as well. But I can't really see any of the others trying to make the running here. So, you know, if those two could end up having quite an easy lead on the front and be quite difficult to pass, then I'm not sure I really want to have a bet in the race. But it'll be interesting to see if anything does really take a step forward and mark themselves as potential lakes really okay well we're about to see if you like one in the colts and geldings race the three o'clock is the lingfield derby trial stakes over the same trip obviously this one you can get the colts and geldings in this and um, you need to be a colts run in the derby uh the market currently looks like this defiance and illinois are currently the five to two or illinois five to two joint favorites the youth rate to four to one arabic legend 15 to two ambient friendly 17 to two 14 to 1 and bigger the rest of the field. 
Um, another one that could take a massive step forward here is Illinois, who was in that Bally Sax trial. Um, I wouldn't be shocked to see this horse take a huge step forward, actually. But I thought Defiance is second last time was really interesting. I, I can see why these two are at the top of the market. What do we make of this one, Johnny Pearson? I, well, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure we're going to have a Derby winner from this race. But the one that sort of did catch my eye was Defiance from mm. his run in the, the Blue Rimmer at Epsom last time. He was, you know, held up well back, win a much better position throughout the race and finished really strongly. And if he steps up like the, the Thousand Guineas winner for Roger Berrien at the weekend when he, and takes a big step forward, then he could be very difficult to be. And I think that forms as strong as anything in the race from, from those that have run so far this season. And which is all of them maybe which is actually all of them which is which is a nice change and yeah i think defiance could be difficult to beat him okay yeah defiance i really was I really are catching that run at epsom um and that was a, a performance that i've noted down i've got this horse in my note but whether this horse is good enough to win a derby i'm not sure but um ed nicholson to you in this do you think we'll see a derby winner or a real good derby type probably not see a derby winner but we have done in the not too distant past um Illinois would be my selection, basically because of the form we've seen so far. It is the best horse in the race. That's that's <laughs> basically why I'm going for it. Yeah. Uh, rated 108. Uh, I mean, the thing is, he did he did disappoint in in Ireland, didn't he? In the Bally Sax Group Three. Before that, he, he was placing Group One in in um in France. Um, and I've watched the replay at least three times today. It's the strangest race that. I don't know if the, what the other guys think, but a very strange race. Dallas Star won it, but the horse that looked like it was going to win finished fourth. And the, the two um, O'Brien horses who run against each other again, Illinois and Euphrates, kind of they just plugged on, and I couldn't believe Euphrates went past Illinois even. So I really don't know what to make of that race. It's normally a, a very good race for the future um, future mile and a half races and mile yes. and quarter races. Um, so the fact that Illinois was eight to eleven that day um, and was miles favoured in front of uh, uh, his other horse Euphrates, um, I think they were expecting a much, much, much better performance. Okay, so Illinois at the top of the market, the one for Ed. Matt, I'll come to you for the Derby Trial Stakes. Who do you like in this? Yeah, similar to Ed, I, I just sort of thought Illinois would was the best horse. Really, I mean. He was undeniably disappointing on reappearance, but I, given O'Brien's MO, I, I don't know if I'd hold that against him completely. Um, just thinking back to last year when he, he ran in that uh, Criterium de Saint Clou, I thought he shaped really well. Like the the first two came nearest to the standside rail, and he sort of got a bit marooned off it, which didn't look like the the, the place to be. He beat Ramadan, who's won a, a listed in a, a Group Three race, I think, so far this year. Bracken's laugh was in behind who improved a chunk in that um, Kentucky Derby qualifier thing that they have at Chelmsford, whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, it's hard to get past that Bally Sachs run, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if he took a big step forward and, and, and just was the best horse in this. I'm not a massive fan of the, the Euphrates. I don't really like his head carriage mm -hmm. um, and nothing else really sort of leapt off the page to me, to be honest. So, um, yeah, I thought Illinois would, would be the one. Yeah, and I'll vote for Illinois for Matt Garner. Then let's move on to the final race we're covering on the ITV card. The 335 at Lingfield is the Chartwell Philly Stakes. It's a Group 3 contest over seven furlongs. And Remarkey is the even money favourite. Great Generation 2 to 1. Celsa Bilo is 9 to 1. Stenton Glider 10 to 1. Many Tears 14 to 1. Serona 16 to 1. Vetiver 20 to 1. Born to Rock. And Le Blue 33 to 1. Remarkey's obviously got that Group 1 form in the book. Coronation stakes second behind Zahira, then behind Nashua in the uh, Falmouth at Newmarket's July course. Looks the one to beat here. Dropping back to seven furlongs. It's interesting to see that Remarkey and Stenton Glider, last time they met, was over seven furlongs right on their seasonal debut last, last year. And it was only a neck between them. I thought Stenton Glider might be a fair each way price here, but I think we may all be in agreement that Remarkey will be the one to beat here. Edge, start with you. She's the class act, um, has had wind surgery over the winter. Um, but on if you look at all the level of forms, she's just miles ahead. Um, you'd like a bigger price, but around about the, on the you know six to five, five to four, that's that would be good enough for me. I think she's probably the most of all the races we've looked at. I think she's the one that when you look at it, you think, yeah, she win. Okay, yeah, remark, yeah, she, she's so solid at the top of the market. Johnny Pearson, you in agreement there that she'll probably win. Yeah, I think she 
just going to be too good for the rest of them here. There's not not a huge amount to say. If she turns up in form in the form she was in last season, I can't see the others getting her anywhere, anywhere near her. Absolutely. Do you think uh, how much of a step forward, Matt? Do you think she's going to have taken going this season? How good potentially could she be? I mean, obviously competing in Group Ones and and finishing second in these events. Is there is there potential for her to be a Group One winner or? Mm, I, I I don't know. Um... <laughs> depending on how strong the Phillies division ends up being, I think, to be honest. Um, I mean, you know, I think the point to make is n- none of these in opposition can boast anything like the Tahira Nashua form. Like, they, they just can't. Um, she did fluff the lines on a final start. It wasn't a group one in France, but it was a, a considerably softer group one, and she got beat. Um, that was only a couple of weeks after the Falmer, so I'd be, I'd be keen enough to, to overlook that. I suppose the only concern would be you do see these Phillies that... They almost they almost run up to the level of, of competition a little bit. Um, you know, you'll see you might see a, a filly that finishes like third or fourth in a group one, and then they don't repeat it. And you think, why why she why she missed the penalty kick at a group three or whatever? But I, I think she's just got such a class edge that that might not be an issue here for her. So um, yeah, like the like the other boys, I think she'll take plenty of beating. There we go, and there's your hat trick course for this week, Remarkey in the Chartwell Philly Stakes at Lingfield. And that is the ITV Racing Card covered. We'll be back shortly after this with a quick preview of the French Classics this weekend as well as any other selections and our best bets this weekend. Fancy a bet but find it confusing? Do not fear. Smartview is here to help you. We've taken the traditional race card and removed all the jargon and abbreviations which can be daunting for newcomers. The result is a race card that means making informed choices and picking winners is easier than ever. Our racing experts and data scientists have created an algorithm that puts everything a seasoned punter would consider into the attribute bars you see on the race card and assesses each runner with an overall score out of 100. Welcome back to the final part of this week's racing postcast. Sam Hart, Matt Gardner, Johnny Pearson and Ed Nicholson bringing you now a preview of the French Classics this week. And we're only going to give it a brief mention as they are two top quality races, the Pool d'Essai de Pouliche at 2.50 UK time and the 3.30, which is the Pool d'Essai de Poulain, which is the French 2,000 guineas. Johnny Pearson, I'll come to you. Is there any strong fancies or any horses that you really fancy in either of the two races? Uh, yeah, in the, in the 1,000 guineas, which is the Pouliche, I, as I'm really, really taken by Louise Proctor when she won at Deauville. That was on your weather. That form looks really, really strong. Last time in in April um, on heavy ground, and you know she's another one for the for the shortlist, so to speak. You, you could well run another big race. And with the uh, two thousand guineas, I've not got a overly strong fancy, but I think Keran for the Aga Khan could run a big race at a bit of a price. Okay, there we go. A couple to mention there, Matt Gardner. I mean, I'm I'm hoping that Christopher Head can get his redemption for what happened in the one thousand guineas and win the Poulan. With Ramadan, who's a, a front runner, who who head does so well with, just goes out front and grinds him into submission. Um, so I'm hoping Ramadan can do the business. But we do see Henry Longfellow hopefully returning here, who may be the Aidan O'Brien three-year-old cult that we could get excited about. Yeah, it was a pretty quiet campaign for him last year, wasn't it? He, he, he won a couple of group ones without that much fanfare, really, largely because of City of Troy, I expect. Um, he's got a bit to prove, I think, because they were both small fields beating a similar pool of horses he does look like the sort of horse that's going to improve a chunk at three but um i think he's going to have to a little bit um i thought bo vatier might reverse that form with ramadan um i really liked him last year i thought he'd be the yeah. best of the french two-year-olds um he came up short against rosalian but i don't think he was that well placed that day like he wasn't behind ramadan and i suppose that's the concern again is that he gets a bit too far back um, but I do like him quite a bit. Um, I also really like Dancing Gemini. Um, that listed win that he last year, like I was blown away by that. I know he flopped in the in the futurity a bit, but I think the ground was probably too soft for him. And you know, physically, he he really looked like the sort that would make a proper three year old. Um, so yeah, of the of the Colts, they they were probably the two in in there that I liked the most. Um, just touching on romantic style, you know. It's not just the Romatuel form. She beat a day in Devon last year, who's done really well so far this year for yes. Millman's. Um, you know, she she should run it. She should. Well, she could have won the new market race, couldn't she? Really, like I think she's got a lot going for her. Um, so 
yeah, I think there's there's plenty of interest in, in both of those races, really. They're fascinating contests, both of them. They really are. And I agree with you a bit with Bovatier, obviously, that um, chasing home Ramadan the last day. But as a two-year-old, this horse is really strong two-year-old form, especially beating Ramat Joel in a, a narrow finish as a two-year-old. So, look, it's a, a really interesting contest. You're going to see the British, the Irish... And the French competing here. Look, take note of that on Sunday. You've got 250 and 330 from Longchamp. Certainly worth keeping your eye on those races. Is there any other horses this weekend? Just quickly to mention Johnny Pearson. Anything else, or is, is that it from you this week? Uh, there's a couple of races that caught my uh, Leopardstown on Sunday. Firstly, the 225s, a group three for three year old fillies. We'll see one look for Paddy Toomey, who, and she yeah. so far has, you know, gone debut in the car in September. Looks. An absolute aeroplane, albeit on soft ground. You know, she was very impressive when winning opening this season, but once again, that was on, on heavy ground. So the big question is how well she's going to go on better surface and in, you know, more competitive races. But she could be, she's still got, you know, the tag of could be anything. And then potentially the best arbitrial of the weekend comes in the 335. And the two that have caught my eye most this season are Spoken Truth for Dermot Weld and London City for Aidan O'Brien. OK, it won a maiden at, Dun, at Dundalk, but I thought those were actually a really impressive run. And the seconds of both those races run in the 7 o'clock at Cork, is it Cork, I think it's Cork, on Friday evening. So it'll be interesting to see how that one plays out as well and whether we've got a potential derby winner from that race on Sunday. Okay, yeah, interesting that. Uh, London City's one who hasn't shown much at two, but has won on debut this season for Aidan O'Brien as a three-year-old. Honestly, this horse could take a huge step, but I'd agree with that. I didn't realise London City was actually running this weekend. But, yeah, that's one to keep an eye on. Also, the Dermot World horse, Spoken Truth in there, another one to keep an eye on. But it could be a really good derby trial there at Leopardstown, the 335. Matt, anything else from you this weekend? Uh, yeah, uh, 455 at Ascot, massive field sprint handicap. I, lo- I love a big field sprint handicap. Um, Mr. Bluebird for, for Heather Main. He, I thought he ran a really good race on reappearance. It was over five furlongs. He's, he's, he's an out-and-out six furlong horse. Um, he's got Ethan Jones, uh, a really, really good value seven-pound claimer, I think, uh, taking the ride for the first time. You know, it is a massive field. It's really competitive, but he's come down the weights, and I just thought he looked primed to 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 win second time out. I didn't necessarily anticipate that that would be in a twenty run a plus handicap, but um, I think he's he's definitely really interesting. Okay, there we go. A few horses. Oh, you got one, Ed? No, I was just going to say we're going two extra places in that race as well, in the bet. So um, that might be uh, worth taking advantage of. You've got to follow Matt's selection. There we go, yeah, two extra plays. I mean, yeah, with, with that many runners, they'll be ideal for, for punters, I'm sure, following each way. Anyway, right, time to get the best bets this week and then find out who the panel like as their big fancy. I'll kick things off. I'm going to be fairly boring. I'm going to go to the Swinton Handicap Hurdle and I'm going to put up Lark in the morning at 85-40. to 40. Unibet will be boosting all the prices of the naps at the time of the upload so you can get all of our naps uploaded from around 7pm on Thursday evening. Ed Nixon, to you next. Who's your nap going to be? Remarkey for me, the 335 at Lingfield. Remarkey for Ed, then the 335 at Lingfield. Matt, to you, who's going to be the best bet? Uh, Pearl Dorr in the in the Victoria Cup. And I think given how solid a case he made for him, Ed can, Ed can get a point for that as well when he wins. OK, Pearl Dorr in the Victoria <laughs> Cup then. David Amar and Sylvester the Souza there. And Johnny Pearson finish us off with the best bets. I'm going to go with Topanga in the 205 for Andrew Boarding and Ashim Murphy. Never be scared of the drip. Topanga for Johnny Pearson, but Ed Nixon was also keen on that horse as well. We'll see how the naps get on and review those next weekend. Just quickly, I'll spin round the panel, find out what everyone's up to on this glorious sunny weekend coming up. Uh, Matt, I'll start with you. Probably going to be cycling, to be fair. Yeah, hopefully. I'll be, I'm working a bit, actually, this weekend, uh, which is badly timed, isn't it, given the weather. Um, but, yeah, a bit of cycling, uh, mainly looking forward to York next week. That's the that's yes. the, the big thing for me. Favourite favorite meeting of the year by, by a mile, the Dante meeting. Um, love it. So, um, yeah, looking forward to that. And in one word, is there an early fancy for the Dante meeting? Oh, um, yeah, that uh, I can't remember her name. That Carl Burke filly that finished second on debut... Uh, she's going to run in the Marygate, I think. Uh, two-year-old filly, River Sen or something. I think she was it the other day. So yeah, I liked her. 
Okay, keep note of that then. Yeah, the Dante meeting next week. Johnny Pearson, what are you up to this weekend? Hey, what doing? Bit of golf, maybe watch some racing, maybe maybe go cycling as well. You know, we've got the Giro started, really putting me in the mood for it. But more importantly, Sam, seeing as it's your birthday today, what what are you up to this weekend? Yeah, I uh, didn't didn't mention it at the top of the show. Yeah, thirtieth birthday today. Um, I I don't know I don't know how our, our head producer Dave Lowe's got me working on such a day, but yeah, I'm working today. I'm off tomorrow, spending a bit of time with the family. Working again on Saturday, and then on Sunday I'm going for a lovely meal with the whole family, which would be really nice. So keeping it nice and quiet, nice and chilled get into the 30s now i've got to be sensible um right there we go that's it for this week's show big thanks to matt gardner to johnny pearson to Unibet's ed nicholson as always do like comment share and subscribe get involved down below and we'll read some of the comments out potentially next week on the show but until then do gamble responsibly and we'll see you soon <laughs>